Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am tremendously honored and just delighted to have uh, Randy Lump here today to talk about Walter Ong and his thought, his legacy, his scholarship. Um, Walter Ong is the deepest thinker I know on language. Uh, so I really look forward to discovering this uh, along with Randy. So thank you, Randy, for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I was uh, delighted to be able to uh, listen in on uh, Tom, your session with Tom last week. And I uh, would love to have been there with uh, Sarah uh, Vandenberg. Um, the, uh, I, I guess I would introduce this to, by saying that uh, Sarah is um, known to, to say I don't, I don't know how commonly, but I suspect pretty commonly, uh, that scholarship on Walter on or is, is of three kinds. It's about Walter, it's with Walter, and it's with Walter and like Walter. And I, I guess that today, th th this is going to be a little bit of, the, uh, of that kind of thing, uh, all three of those things, because uh, that's, that's what I do, and I, I do a little bit of each of them, and I've been doing it for so long that I can't always tell the difference between what I'm thinking and what Walter thought. So I hope you will forgive me for that. I'll try to be as uh, as clear as I can about that. As, as Shrikan pointed out, I, I, the, my journey to Walter Ong began about 54 years ago um, when I went off to Canada to uh, study with Marshall McLuhan. Uh, at least that was my intention. I had I was teaching in a, in in Ohio, and I was living in a house that was absolutely brimming over with McLuhan, and I had no idea they, what they were talking about when I came back from the summer. And I, in self defense, picked up understanding media and started reading it, and I had no idea what he was talking about until at some point it started to click. And I got so engaged in this, partly because I couldn't escape it. I was living with four other people who were talking McLuhan constantly. And so I began to realize, I was teaching theology, I realized that uh, this is somebody that needs to be reckoned with. Anyway, I went up there and got started with, with, uh, with Marshall. I uh, met with him and at some point I, 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 well, I discovered a book by Walter Ong in a little bookstore in, uh, in, uh, in Ottawa. And I, in the book, desk jacket said that he was a friend of Marshall McLuhan. And well, of course my antennae went up. And he was, a, here was this Jesuit who had things to say, say about theology. And what I wanted to do was work on that very thing. So eventually I, I realized that uh, Ong was, would be more appropriate for me to focus on. And uh, that's that's where I uh, ended up going, and that was the beginning of a journey that hasn't uh, even slowed down the tiniest bit. Uh, I began to discover, even though I'd had undergraduate and graduate school and a decent liberal arts education, I guess, that I was about to begin, or I was in the beginning of getting a liberal education because a uh, Walter Ong is extremely huge. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him, but he's, uh, he is he is an, a liberal education ongoing as you read him. And, and I'll say a couple of things about that. Um, I was where when I was working on my dissertation, I found uh, or my my director left, and it took him a year to get me a new director. So in the meantime, uh, Father Ong was uh, doing critiques of what I was writing. And I uh, was in, very indebted to him for that, obviously. I never would have made it without him. And uh, I've kept in touch with him in a variety of ways after that. People typically, at least in my experience, they, you've got to decide a part to be partisan for McLuhan or Ong. And I think that's a very serious mistake. They are doing, very similar things, but also very different things. Uh, when McLuhan is probing, he is uh, 
just doing that. I, I the, the metaphor that always comes to mind when I think about him is, is Edgar Allan Poe's Maelstrom. He's looking to see what's going on around him, and he's caught up in the swirl, and he takes shot at, shots at it to see what, what he might find out. Uh, Walter is a much more conventional scholar. Um, he does he appears to be doing something very ordinary from the viewpoint of being a the topics he picks up and and how uh, you know in uh, as an english professor but you you in my experience again you if you get into anything he does you get dragged all over the place uh he is he much like McLuhan, he's very skilled at making connections and networking various kinds of thinkers. So he doesn't spend a lot of time unpacking individual thinkers when you read him. He mentions people that he thinks are productive areas to, to follow up on. So you, uh, I, I take his uh, approach to things as giving us a, an itinerary, a huge uh, array of points of connection and if you follow up on those, you begin to swim in waters that have a whole lot of things going on in them. And it keeps on going. Um, uh, as with McLuhan, if, if you've read McLuhan, you know that you can read him again and again, and it's always going to be something new. Um, and it's certainly that way with Ong. He's not flashy. Um, he's a Midwesterner. He comes from uh, Kansas City. Mm -hmm. I, when I first read the oral autobiography of Harry Truman, uh, uh, which was done by, um, oh shoot, I'm forgetting his name, Merle. Uh, anyway, I was listening to this at, or reading this, and I realized, my gosh, here's Walter Ong at work. I mean, it sounded so much like him. Uh, I was really, really sort of stunned. But then I realized, no, this is, this is a Midwesterner. Uh, Ong was born and bred in uh, Missouri, and he 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 sounds like he's he's that, not with with a, an accent so much as uh, how his thinking works. McLuhan's a Midwesterner too in Canada, but I think his approach to things is much more urban, mm -hmm. uh, and he thrived in that environment, and that's where his the people who are interested in him uh, largely uh, are from. Uh, the result is, is that you get a, um, a very different read on a lot of the same things by bouncing back. So when I really want to be stimulated and shaken up, I read McLuhan. And when I, when I want to go a little slower, but really get down in, in the mix of things in a very circumstantial and very articulate way that's pointing me in directions, uh, but connecting between them, yeah, then, then I read Walter on, wow. and so oh, that that's a great way of putting it. And I think the Midwestern character versus urban character, uh, I think I think captures kind of the difference of style and emphasis. Yeah. Um, but I think the thing that is common to both of them, which is actually quite unusual in today's academia or people in yeah. general, is this idea of liberal education that they are basically going and trying to look at everything connected with human beings and yeah. our, their, their mind is freely going and making connections relentlessly between those things. So the scope of their minds, uh, of what wrongs minds is enormous. And I think that is uh, partly the way he was brought up, the way he was trained uh, as a Jesuit and as a scholar. And he, uh, he got very good at it. Uh, he, he's not light reading, but I think he's he's uh, intelligible. I think if once you catch on to it, can you elaborate on that? I mean, because that's because what happens is that the method, um, the kind of the background which enabled him to think that way, that kind of built his ability to think that way, is crucial to understanding him. So, how is his Jesuit background? Um, what, what is the relationship between his Jesuit background and what he does? Yeah, let me say a couple things about that uh, first. Um, I think he his his approach to things is very much a product of his 
of what he got into in, 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 in being in a Jesuit educational setting himself as a student uh, in college. And then it was one that exposed you to what he later characterized as the whole history of Western thought, mm -hmm. you know, philosophically, in literature, in, in, in a lot of different ways, and, and focused on your capacity to articulate not only in writing, but to uh, be able to talk about things like that. So it's, it's a result, it's very conversational style, and it's very dialogical. Uh, he, You've got to, you, this isn't the sort of thing you do all by yourself, you know, it's, it's not Cartesian, it's, it, you're, you've got to be in constant conversation with uh, other people. And it leads to a kind of, I, I think for him, it's, it's, you know, a constitutional matter of, of curiosity. Uh, you learn how to pay attention to things and you ask questions and you look at this and that. Um, and he was interested in everything. Now, where did that come from? Well, if you sit around the dinner table every night with a group of PhDs in all kinds of different fields, and all you have to do is talk about what's e what each other is up to, I think it's a way of stimulating <laughs> the things you think about. If you want to take advantage of it, of course, not everybody does. But if in one of the advantages of living in a Jesuit community with a bunch of people who are committed to the same kind of work is that you... Um, you have to, if, if you get, if you're curious, you have to ask them questions about what's going on in there and relating it to the things that you do. And he certainly did that. Uh, I think last week, Tom mentioned, uh, or last time Tom mentioned, uh, Tom Sadek, the game that the Jesuit scholastics used to play where they had, it was, one of my colleagues was a, was a practitioner of that. And they would get together ahead of time before dinner and on uh, like talking to the younger Jesuits too. And he'd say, um, and they, they had this game, they called it Stump Walter. And they tried to come up with a topic that he couldn't talk about. And about the only time they ever did this was, it was either some topic that one of them came up with in quantum physics or something like that. It was something really obscure and it wasn't anything he'd ever heard about so he couldn't get into it. Well, the last time they played the game uh, as they were assembling there and they were in the rec room and they were sitting around talking. And uh, one of the Scots got up and said, well, before we get started here, uh, Father, I'm going to get, get an Eskimo pie. And, uh, and, and Ong's response was, oh, yes, well, I know the man who uh, invented the Eskimo pie. And he began to talk and they said, oh, to heck with it. We're not going to try to do this anymore. <laughs> But he, uh, he was like that. I remember walking across the campus one day with him at St. Louis U, and we went past a petunia bed. And, and keeping up with him was always a challenge for me, especially at my young age. And I, we walked past this bed of petunias, and I said, uh, oh, those petunias smell nice. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to quit smoking. And, uh, and then the, your sense of smell comes back. So I'm just making conversation, you know, and he says, Oh yes, you you know of course that the uh, tobacco plant is related to the uh, petunia plant. And the first time I saw a tobacco plants, I was sure enough, it looks like they look like great big uh, petunia plants. So what are you going to wow. do? Well, wow. it was interesting uh, when Sarah was here. She said Father Ong would talk to anybody on anything for as long as they were willing to talk. That's right. That is <laughs> absolutely right. And it was good, and it was. And it wasn't just monologue. I mean, you he, he, he did, and I think of reading his works is this way too. Uh, it it invites you to bring in to the conversation what you uh, what you know, and he'll he'll be giving you clues and signposts and things that you might go and explore. Uh, and I think that's very important. I would describe describe his thinking as heuristic. It's it's a way of asking questions that leads to more questions. And that's why I think he's interested in, interp in interpretation, because everything we do is interpretation. Uh, it is interesting. Um, the, I mean, when I hear about Father Ong's approach to conversation, it reminds me of people like Aquinas, you know, during the Middle Ages, where there are these books that you revere that are really important, 
and a whole bunch of you are studying those books because and you want to get to the heart of it mm-hmm. and you do that by conversation so the conversation is not for sake of conversation it is very much tied to taking the book and taking your understanding of it to a new level because the other person that you're talking to has a different context is bringing a different context and by trying to understand the context from which the other person is coming you are enriching your understanding and doing that not just with one person but being on the premise of doing that for everything that you're doing that's a very different view of conversation than is common to in today's day oh i i think so and there's a whole lot involved in that and in if you have some commonalities you can build on that conversation gets richer and richer you know one of the sad things i think uh, if i may say something about mcclellan is that the, that his dissertation was published posthumously because that thing on the trivium that he wrote if you don't if you try to read mcclellan without reading that i think you really miss half the picture because it's implicit in everything that he does and if you mention aquinas it certainly was implicit in everything that aquinas was doing because he was sitting around the dinner table with people who were, who knew that inside and out it's not like you're coming in cold uh, you're everybody knows the tradition knows the literature knows the 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 poetry knows the rhetoric from the trivium and the quadrivium and they've been steeped in it in the, and and so you would well go back to education what aquinas was doing was trying to develop a, cur- a curriculum an educational program uh, that was not carried out in textbooks so much as in conversation or more formally disputation that you you argued things out you got to something that everybody could get agree on or or not agree on whatever um i mean another comment that tom made that was really fascinating to me is he was talking about the milieu of mm-hmm. st louis university uh the fact that there were 100 you know over 100 people plus who knew latin who were conversant mm-hmm. with all the works and these are the people whom father ong is interacting with now that creates like a very large community it's not not like a specialized one little department that you're just talking to people who are working on exactly the same problem but you have a common language a common base of knowledge that you can all count on and then yes. you're talking about a wide range of topics that uh, so it's a very different kind of um the the ground very different ground for developing your own uh, own thoughts you know trying to trying to manage together an, a vast common background i mean that's not the experience i think of most people in higher education uh, these days i mean everything is so siloed that i mean if you're talking to people in another department that seems you know, suspect somehow uh, i was fortunate to be in a small enough place of for most of the time that i couldn't avoid talking to other people all the time i mean you had to unfortunately it wasn't about it was more about management stuff than about uh, than about the substance but it was there also i mean and that's that's something i think it often gets missed um um no you you mentioned um that the focus of father ong's work was on literacy but with a backdrop of philosophy you know of the entire western philosophy tradition the theology philosophy tradition. literature yes the whole works yeah rhetoric well the, the the trivium i mean and plus the scriptures so you had to everybody knew these things uh, everybody in the conversation anyhow so how so what uh, so if you wanted to say uh, talk about what did father ong have to say about literacy and orality what would you say well it's, it's difficult to characterize simply but let me say this he he had at the time that he was going through school he was getting that curriculum himself they were studying the classics 
they were studying uh, medieval philosophy. They were studying, I mean, this was stock in trade uh, until the mid, uh, up until the 60s in, in Jesuit schools and others as well, but it certainly was there. So you knew Shakespeare, yes, but you also knew Cicero and uh, all of the, the Latins and the Greeks you study, you knew Aristotle and Plato and so forth. And so you, it was, it was the great books before the great books, mm -hmm. um, which was a restoration element, effort when you really come back to it. Um, so he was thoroughly imbued in, with, this, uh, with this tradition and he was directed along the way. He met McLuhan when McLuhan was teaching at St. Louis U. He was Ong's uh, master thesis director uh, with uh, the poetry of, of the sprung rhythm in, uh, in Hopkins, Jared Manley Hopkins. And, um, and McLuhan really got him, you know, they, they hit it off because they were of similar minds in interesting ways, but also in very divergent ways. And Ong pursued this. He, when he went off then to doctoral studies, he started, uh, continued to, to get in, to, uh, to explore where this came from. And, and that's where he came across the idea or was suggested that, I guess, by Harry Miller, who wrote The New England Mind um, at Harvard. Uh, it was suggested to him that he tracked down a guy by the name of Peter Ramus, who was a, a 16th century uh, French mathematician at the University of Paris, who ended up designing the educational program for all of Europe, basically. Hmm. And he was one of, the, it was right at the crooks when things were, when dialectic had separated from the trivium and taken on a life of its own, mathematics, so you have, this is Descartes, this is the whole enlightenment starting to take place. And, um, and so he got into their tracking. How did how did this come about? So he started in the Middle Ages and he worked his way down to to the Enlightenment uh, with the background to um, to Peter Ramus. And what he was what he discovered was this whole complex of how literacy and this focus on texts drove toward a, a more interior and reflective use uh, of words. Uh, at the same time, an attempt to simplify what the experience of the trivium and quadrivium had been in the Middle Ages and before. So he was trying to track this process and he discovered that there was what he called a kind of interior iconoclast. <laughs> Excuse me, an amber alert just went off on them. No problem. Uh, anyway, so he tried to, to, to develop this, and he what he the bottom line is, in a way, or at least one of them, is that it was a, a, a move away from dialogue and conversation to a visual, diagrammatic, either or kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. So instead of an expansive kind of of learning, it was more and more logical huh? in the sense of we'll maybe come back to that later it was mathematical and uh and this changed everything uh it it led to, I mean, there's a um kenneth clark in his thing on civilization tells a story about descartes uh, noon on one day, a bunch of his friends went to his house and found him in bed, and they asked him, "What are you doing?" And he said, "I'm thinking." And they were they were in, they thought they were, they were incredulous. They didn't know what to make of this. That you go off by yourself and you cogitate in your own head instead of slugging it out with people uh, in a conversational or dialogical setting. And this was an, this was an enormous shift in education. And then, and then, consequently, for all of Western civilization. Um, let's focus on this one because this is a point that the modern audience. Because I want to make sure that not only people here, but people who will be watching this on YouTube, get a sense of this. Now, unfortunately, what happens is that trivium is no longer part of the common vocabulary today. Okay. So people don't know what kind of mental habits are inculcated inculcated when people take in the trivium and they become 
proficient at using the trivium. Uh, so you have those people, and then you have people in the modern age who are just using the dialectics, just the logic, and mm -hmm. not the other two parts of grammar and rhetoric. So can you elaborate, you know, what the mind was like? What, what, what was the mind which, which used trivium, you know, all the three, three legs of trivium? And then how was the mind different when they used just the dialect? Okay, well, here comes a thousand years or so of <laughs> a couple of millennia. Um, what happened? What first of all, you it, you have to go back to monasticism. The monastic tradition was really the engine that brought about Western European civilization. In a, in, in uh, the classical idea of education was that you went someplace and you. You talked about, as, as we see in, in Plato's dialogues, you talked with people about, about things and, um, and, and worked it out in, in a kind of uh, dialogical fashion. And, and if, you, if you know Plato's dialogues at all, they're, they're, they're a put up job because Socrates was the main character and he was bugging everybody with thoughts that they didn't understand, and they so they, mm -hmm. they argued about these things, uh, and Plato put it down because he didn't want to have the same thing happen to him that happened to uh, Socrates. Yes. He put it all in uh, Socrates's mouth. Um, so th this this dialogical approach to knowledge is highly uh, it's both literate, but it's it's uh, it's oral as well, but it's. It's, uh, it's kind of an intermediate stage. When you get to Aristotle, you start getting closer to a much more text-based kind of education. Mm -hmm. And it, yes, based on lectures, probably, probably to a great extent, uh, less uh, kind of a seminar kind of approach to things, um, but still trying to pull together what was known from other uh, the thinkers that had come before. And the whole project was really geared away to getting away from the, the pre-literate Greek program, which was based on stories, uh, these big epics like Homer and so on, which were the, the encyclopedias of ancient Greece for, mo for the ordinary folks, because everybody who spoke the language could listen to the bards uh, uh, recite this poetry. And that's a whole big story in itself. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to the Romans who continued this process and used largely Greek texts to do it with and Greek instructors, once the, the empire starts to fall apart, the, the educational program goes to the monasteries. The monks were the only ones for the most part that were literate. And they were sent out all over Europe to civilize all the barbarian tribes that, for those of us who come out of Europe, uh, most of our ancestors, mm -hmm. uh, who were tribal people who were living uh, in the, in not in cities at all, you don't really get cities in Western Europe until the eleventh uh, and twelfth centuries, uh, when cities which grew up with European cities all grew up around monasteries, and. Uh, um, they so what did what did the monks do? Well, they they kept texts. They were they were literate people, and they they copied texts. That was the main thing they did, and they were self sustaining. They grew their food, and they they worked on texts. Um, and the the development of this textual tradition was to try to gather libraries, to create libraries of uh, places of learning. There's a wonderful book by a Frenchman called uh, The Love of Learning and the Desire for God, which really sums up the, the literate mask environments. Well, what was in this? Well, it was called, in terms of the disciplines, the, the trivium, that is to say, grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic. Uh, grammar was more than we we mean by it, we mean, you know, kind of the rules for language, but it was much more involved than that. First of all, it involved learning Latin because you couldn't do any of these things in any of the vernacular languages. So they didn't exist. 
Uh, so you did it in Latin, which was the only really literate language they had to work with to some degree uh, Greek and to some degree Hebrew, but especially Latin. And so you had to teach people how to read and write in order to deal with texts. And then what texts? Well, everything you could get your hands on from the ancient world. And so you learned it from the, the Roman, uh, the Greek philosophers, Plato especially, but also fragments of the others. You learned from Homer, you learned from Cicero, you learned from all the Latin uh, uh, writers that you could find, the uh, poets. And this kind of over time was collected and collected and collected and shared between monasteries and so forth. Uh, you also had rhetoric because you had to learn how not just to say these things or to, uh, pardon me, read these things. Matter of fact, you didn't even read them silently as McLuhan points out, the medieval cell of the of the monk was a, a reading room because you, know, so you, you read out loud and made copies uh, mm -hmm. as you did it. Uh, so the um, that that environment of collecting, focusing on the production of texts um, and then uh, rhetoric. You had to learn how to assemble this yourself for presentation to others. Uh, the universities started this way uh, as uh, well then, pardon me, the third item, dialectic, is is also complex, but it's, it's mainly what we would call logic. And that is to say you had to, it was a complex way of trying to organize all this material so you could teach it to the people behind you. When cities developed and they developed around monasteries because out of trade fairs that, that were, the monks were also into agriculture. So they, trade fairs began with the villages around and then they, you know, once or twice a year and then they became monthly and then pretty soon they became permanent settlements and there's Paris. Mm -hmm. And somebody had to figure out how to relate the monastery, monastery, which was a very different way of life, to the cities. And that's where the Dominicans and the Franciscans come in. Mm -hmm. uh, they went, their job was, uh, the Franciscans was uh, to go downtown and talk to the folks on the street. But you had to be trained for that. So uh, the Dominicans were similar. Uh, they, you had to try to take the learning of the trivium out to the world and uh, to the folks in the cities. And so universities developed in the 1300s. And then we go from there and in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the Renaissance, we get into the humanist colleges, which are aimed at the burgeoning middle class. Uh, and th this is quite an involved process, but anyway, what, what Ong did was study how, what happened to the trivium between the Middle Ages, the 12th, 13th century, and the Renaissance, uh, and then into the Enlightenment. And his study, uh, you know, uh, Tom mentioned last week, hello, Tom, I think I see you there. Yes, Tom is um, here. Uh, Tom mentioned last week that um, I shouldn't do this. I I, I lose my track. That, uh, he dis he discovered mm -hmm. that the move from the the dialogical, conversational, disputational world of the Middle Ages to by the time you move down to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment you find a real restriction that was driven, first of all, by trying to simplify the curriculum for teaching um, people coming into schools because schools were done in Latin, not in the vernacular. So you had to teach people to read and write Latin before they could even participate in schools. And schooling was principally for teachers to tra train teachers. That's why you get a master's. So you get a master of arts was somebody who uh, got uh, who learned to read and write in Latin and did some version of the uh, the uh, trivium and the quadrivium. They were tied up with communication and education. 
And then if you got to be a master of arts, it's really the, the word university, as Ellen points out, universitas in Latin means union, what we would call a union or a guild. And it was the teacher's union. So a baccalaureate is where you were licensed to teach beginners. You were, you got your, you were just like a beginning, an apprentice teacher, uh, a journeyman teacher, a German, like a journeyman plumber is somebody who can now do the work with, under the supervision of a master of arts, a teacher of arts. And the master of arts was the one uh, where the, was the faculty, if you want. Just like a, who operates just like a union. Um, and then there were three other faculties philosophy, theology, medicine, four, pardon me, and law. And it, when you went through the arts curriculum, you wanted to go on, you went into one of those other four faculties and did through the same process. And that was what Aquinas, Aquinas had, had tried to do. What Aquinas was doing in the University of Paris was try to come up with a program for the Dominicans for teaching teachers of theology. And you would do this in medicine, you would do it in law, you would do it in, um, in philosophy. It's very important to realize in this context, I think for when we get down to the enlightenment, that what philosophy meant in the, in the universe, medieval university was all of the things we now call the natural and social sciences. So you got, of necessity, if you if you studied philosophy at all, you got all of the things we call science today. Mm -hmm. Although theology was a science too, that is to say an organized approach to uh, talk about the religious dimension um, of things. Well, I don't know, am I on track with what you were asking yes. for? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But let me ask a uh, focus, I think this is a, crucial background, but let me ask a very focused question. What happens when the dialectic gets separated from the influences of grammar, which actually ties you to what is, and rhetoric, which ties you to the communication with other people as a corrective influence? What happens to people going just with dialectics? Well, you, you can kind of, you, I suppose the extreme example is you can do what Descartes did. You stay in your bed and you think about your own existence mm -hmm. uh, and then try to work your way back to the real world. Um, you know, I think therefore I am. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 Ramus was, was, uh, was right in the middle of this and on had, shows a lot of examples of, of Ramus's way of teaching and the educational program. And as you come up with a topic, and of course the topics go, the, the whole idea of picking a topic and going that way goes clear on back to the Middle Ages with Peter Lombard's sentences and so on, where you can begin to see the simplification process even there mm -hmm. because you, you know, there was so much stuff, you couldn't teach it to anybody. So you had to find ways to, to organize it. And so, you take a topic and you go back through all the literature and you pull out sentences that have to do with this, that, or the other thing. Mm -hmm. And you end up with these masses of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, even that had to be simplified. How do you take junior high school, you know, our early teenage kids and teach them how to read Cicero? Well, for heaven's sake, this gets to be a real big project. So you had to nail it down. Well, Ramus was focused, like mathematicians often are, on devising logical processes to keep things in order. And he devised all these flow charts with brackets, you know, mm -hmm. either or, it's this or that. And then if you do that, and then you take the remaining answer and then you divide that into two more. And you end up with these huge <coughs> kind of outlines and diagrams. And so all you had to do was really kind of take whatever topic you had and plug it into these, mm -hmm. these schema and you could take any subject and digest it that way. And I, yeah, I think that when it, when we look at that, we can see in a way how that kind of education has developed in the kind of curriculum building mm -hmm. that we now have. It's very different because it's linear and you, you go through and you, you pick between two things and then you divide it again and you divide it again and you get 
So it looks like it's like it's differentiation without the integrating forces. So it's Ooh, right because you start from scratch here, and, and no, nobody has the common background. Mm -hmm. So you are at any point of time, you are kind of at one point point in this branch, and you have kind of kept away from all the other branches. Yeah, so you can go back that... and and run through the other direction or something, but you, wow. yeah, it, it was. And of course, this was this was a tremendous upheaval. But it, all, 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 then now this this is where we jump into a whole different realm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because Ong had pointed out. I mean, it, it, we, we he was attentive to the fact that you couldn't do what they did in the Middle Ages without writing. You had to have all these texts. Yes. So writing made this possible. And of course, that drags you back into Aristotle, and Plato, mm -hmm. and the pre Socratics, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. But what the printing press did was it boost this whole process into an even more fragmented business. You could you could get smaller and smaller. We now call it bits. We're down to zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. And you just get lots and lots and lots of zeros and ones and add them all together and you get whatever, alg algorithms and whatnot, and you can manage data. So what is given is the data you can crank out. It's not any longer the sort of swimming around for years and years wow. in this mass of literature to where you have absorbed it into your, into wow. your soul. It's working logically to through these steps. Wow, wow. So, I, so I, the, but yeah. this is, I, oh, I remembered what I wanted to point out that Tom pointed out last week, mm -hmm. and that is that it's a, it's really too bad that people who read on only read orality and literacy. This is this is often one of those brackets. I mean, it, it's that's overstating it. Mm -hmm. He he really puts a lot of stuff in to flesh out those mm -hmm. concepts, but but you really have to read if you want to know how he got there. Read uh, re, um, his dissertation, which incidentally was the largest, at least at that point, uh, dissertation ever produced at Harvard. Uh, and it was 1,700 pages in the manuscript, and it and the first part of it, Ramus' method and the decay of dialogue, mm -hmm. is still in print. Mm -hmm. And when you come out with a dissertation in 1958 that's still in print, that's something. that's something really uh, kind of prodigious. But anyway, yes, uh, this is a real tour through that period of time, much the way you know it's comparable or analogous, at least to what McLuhan did in, in the Trivium. And, and uh, but, but Mark, uh, Ong's thesis was published out front in his work, whereas we didn't get the Trivium published until, gosh, around 2000, I think is but when that- you, uh, you made a very intriguing statement about, about this. So, and I want to ask you about that. You said that McLuhan cannot really be understood. You can't really understand McLuhan's work without the Trivium. So can you talk about what is the role of McLuhan's work on the trivium in his corpus and in his thinking? Well, he he's pretty cryptic. I mean, he, he, he did kind of traditional scholarship too, mostly on things like jo James Joyce mm -hmm. and mostly in smaller venues. Mm -hmm. his, his, the work that he's known for in public tends to be very aphoristic, very flamboyant. Uh, um, well, you know, if you've ever seen his work, it, he doesn't talk about the trivium. He doesn't mm -hmm. do, he probes around and he gives you a basket full of probes and say, well, go and sort this out. Go where you want with it. And, uh, he doesn't fill in the gaps for you. It's cool, not hot, you know, as he mm -hmm. would say. So, but the, the, his work on the trivium is the ground against which all the figures in his more popular work is uh, is rooted. And and so it's all there. And boy, you know, it starts to make sense. You go through that trivium book and you suddenly say, okay, I see what he's up to. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it makes much more wow. sense. It's much easier to get what he's about there, but it wasn't available. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you did know the trivium, you could you could do something that you couldn't do otherwise. Uh, but it was really an eye opener when I for me when I read it. I said, okay, because I always thought you, when you read McLuhan, you got to read him like poetry, mm -hmm. and then then it'll work. People who try to expect you know, read his stuff and try to expect a nice linear, and he tells you he's not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. ABC calls it absent-mindedness. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're not going to get there in linear force. And well, why was he doing that? If you're caught in this maelstrom, you don't have time to do that. You need to pay attention and get it, mm -hmm. you know, get, the, get going on it right now. Try to figure out mm -hmm. what's going on. And of course, he's brilliant at that. But a lot of people who are stuck with the other model don't can't even get there. Wonderful. So let me change gears and ask about Two, at least two aspects of uh, Father Ong's work. One is his pairing of mythos and logos, which separates him dramatically from Plato who complains about the poets or from uh, Descartes. Uh, so talk a little bit about how he sees the relationship between mythos and logos. Okay. The Greeks have two words that um, one of them is muthine, from which our word myth comes. I'll say some more about that in a second. The other one is logine, which comes, which, uh, and, and uh, from which our word logic comes. So they have, they have these two words and muthine, I think the best simple way to translate it from my in my experiences would be to call it storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's much more than that, mm -hmm. you know, but it is the storytelling uh, that that Plato wants to run out of town, okay? And what, to make, make, it, make it short, uh, what we want to have is logic. Now, logic is more like mathematics. And this, if you go back to Plato's Republic and you're, read in the same area there. I'm trying to remember if it comes right before or right after the, uh, the uh, analogy of the cave. Mm -hmm. you, re you have what's called Plato's line. And in there, he gives us a schematic, uh, you know, a chart of the different, he breaks it out into different parts, uh, a chart of the knowledge of the way knowledge works. And there are two main divisions what he calls episteme, from which our epist epistemology comes, which is the analysis of, of knowledge, and doxa. And doxa, which is really kind of an interesting word, we have in the religious language a doxology, which is a something like glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That, that's a doxology. And, it, and for Plato, it, it means appearance, the way things appear to us. Logos is an organizing way of going at knowledge. And it's probably originally really based in, in literacy and in, in phonetic writing. Uh, you have to, in order to keep track, it's hard to do. Some people can apparently do mathematics, complex mathematics in their head. I certainly can't. I've got to put it down on paper or I can't, I'm not, I don't get anywhere. Um, we have biologic and psychologic and sociologic and all of these different aspects of reality we can study by defining terms, organizing them, getting a, dis a discourse that follows one, two, three, or ABC, however, uh, the sort of thing that is implicit in Aristotle and Plato uh, is when they're trying, I mean, you, you see it more clearly, I think, in, in in um, um, in Aristotle, because he's got everything organized, categories and so forth, and works it out in a much more logical fashion. <clears throat> of course, that realizes that they didn't have Euro Europeans didn't have Aristotle until really until the 13th, 12th and 13th century, and so er that's why Aristotle came in and with this organizing thing which they put to work like crazy and 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 that mindset led to to the uh, enlightenment um 
Where was I? Am I on on track with yeah, that? Yeah, that, that's good. So, so the question is, how does how um, how does Father Ong think about mythos and logos? What 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 is the relationship between the two? This is where it gets difficult because I have to. I, I should turn this over to Tom. The um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the book that uh, Sarah and Tom put together or, or brought to publication, A Language in Hermeneutics, Language in Interpretation, am I getting that right? Uh, it's A Language in her Hermeneutics. Uh, as, uh, as, uh, uh, is, is really, I think, Ong's attempt to describe the whole thing that he'd been trying to do. Mm -hmm. There's really nothing new I think that he says in there because he's been was trying to write that book over a long period of time, mm -hmm. couldn't quite get it right, at least to his satisfaction. <clears throat> but I think there are points in there that he really focuses in a way that's implicit in what he did all along, but much more um, much more focused, and it's. It, it ties in interestingly to, to some things that Eric McLuhan did and is, continues to do. That mythos is really, to put it in Aristotelian terms, what we might call the formal cause of human thought. It's the whole, it's what, uh, um, what uh, P Plato called uh, doxa, which is, composed of what we would call faith and symbol, pistis and ikasia, symbol making. Uh, and so mythos would be that whole world of stories and other, of images. This is what he has in mind, I think, partly in the analogy of the cave, when he's saying most people are just looking at images that are going back and forth. Uh, this is really quite fair. If you understand Homer, you see Homer as as in the stories telling all about the things that the Greeks knew and every Greek that was an adult certainly, but even kids were exposed to these things. They knew the stories and the stories told you how the world worked in, the, in, the, in terms of what we call gods and goddesses. But really what they're talking about are the powers that are observable that we see operating in the world. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier that topics like orality and literacy are utterly fascinating concepts, but they don't really get you very far unless you bring it down to earth, because every society on the planet has its own mythos. That is to say, its own stories and other forms that express in, a, in a, an intelligible, memorizable, repeatable way the relationships between the powers that are operating in the in the venue that you live in. You know, there's 500 recognized Native American tribes in the United States. That is to say, from the, recognized by the federal government. There's 45 different language groups, and uh, utterly different mythoi, mm -hmm. myth systems. But they're not just made up stuff. They are things, their traditional materials been passed on, the stories. And of course, if we look at any civilization, we're going to, any, any culture, we're going to see this going on. It's all the information that you've managed to accumulate and package up in a memorable and repeatable way. Uh, and, and so if you look at, for example, the Lakota up in the northern tier of the United States, um, they were extremely observant of celestial processes. Surprise, surprise. Uh, they could calculate how to move around from season to season by observing the position of the constellations and, uh, and then knowing where you had to go, how the, they had they coordinated the geography with the movement of the constellations around the, the year. So you could you could say, okay, such and such a constellation is in this location. Therefore, now it's time for us to pack up and move because the buffalo are going to be going south. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had this, it was an immensely sophisticated system. The Pueblos who were agricultural had had the same kind of thing. They worked with the geography, 
the world for them was within four sacred mountains. And within that, they had a finely tuned ritual system and a, and a mythic system that, that gave them the program, the, the software, if you want, for that living and trying to grow crops in that environment. They knew when to plant the crops. It was when uh, this and that and the other thing was in the story taking place. And it's, a, it's an immensely sophisticated system. And it worked, you know, mm -hmm. most of you try growing corn down there and staying alive mm -hmm. over periods of hundreds of years, it's not going to work. The Navajo moved into territory that the Pueblos had abandoned because their system wasn't working anymore because of drought. So the Navajos figured out, they were latecomers, they figured out how to hybridize what they could get from the Pueblos and how they could figure out their own scheme for operating in that southwestern desert. Mm -hmm. Very sophisticated. So mythos is not logic, mm -hmm. but it is if you if you if you get into the system and, and being able to assimilate that, if you could do that and make it work for you, you could survive in that environment. And that's what they did. It wasn't separated out into little particles. And in the case of the Navajo, their myth, their origin myths, if you want, or their their cosmologies differ from one end of you know, Arizona, there's huge 250,000 square miles they got to deal with. From one end of the reservation or their, their traditional territory to the other, there are variations in those stories that account for geologic environmental differences in those places, in one place to another. So, I mean, yeah. this is mythos. Well, well um, I want to hit one last topic. Uh, there are amazing people here on the call, so I want to give them a chance to uh, talk uh, in small groups and then come back and ask you questions. So the last topic I want to focus on is probably the most important one, uh, which is what is Father Ong's approach to the challenges we face today as individuals at a global level or ev everything in between? So how is his He's, he has an uh, kind of interdisciplinary uh, approach to thinking about everything, but there is, what, what is his approach to solving, you know, thinking about uh, these, these problems? Well, I don't think he offers us any solutions. I think what he does is try to chart out some of the dynamics that we are we have at our disposal if we want to understand these kind of meta processes that are operating on us that we don't pay any attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, for example, we talk about ecology, which is an attempt to talk about the whole, but we only, usually only talk about parts. So ecology means we got too much uh, um, plastic in the ocean. We got too much, uh, I mean, we, it's fragmented. You know, what does, how do we create a habit of mind that allows us to talk about everything at once? Well, first of all, we don't do that just as individuals. We have to do it collaboratively. You got to have whole teams working on things like that. Even if you're going to get at a pandemic, how do you do that? Well, you, you have to have people who know something about viruses, but you got to have people know something about economics and production systems and supply chains and you know, everything else, you know, what doesn't fit into that and that bringing that to the surface, I think, incidentally, is part of what we were talking about earlier. How do you educate people to have that not to be just thinking in terms of, of, of channels, but in terms of matrices? In other words, how do we create a mythic, mythic on calls it secondary orality, you got you got to somehow get the the oral mindset, the mythic mindset, sign, uh, mindset. You know, I've tried to I spend a lot of time trying to reconstruct the word myth. See, we only use it from a logical viewpoint, and myths are things that are false, right? Mm -hmm. They're things that are in the common awareness. Well, how do you upgrade the common awareness, the common sense, which is the word for it, the Greek word is pistis, which we translate in English as faith, but mm -hmm. that myth is a whole lot. How do we train people to have a that sort of thing that at least on one level the the, the trivium did? It got you 
you know, into a broad enough conversation that you could understand the, the parts interacting. It's, it's, it's open systems thinking, whereas we have tended since Gutenberg at least to think in closed systems. We got this in a nutshell. Here's this group of people there, they're in this box. Here's this topic, it's in this box. Well, it isn't like that. No, reality isn't like that. Uh, so how do we teach people how to do that? Well, I think Ong and McLuhan in their very different ways, but certainly Ong gives us some examples because he, he's saying you got to dialogue with a lot of people in a lot of different forms. You can't just put it in a box. This was what he, his objection to the new criticism in literature. You don't want to just do give biographies of authors. What you want to do is get to the poems, but you can't treat the poems as though they exist in the bell jar in a vacuum. You have to treat them in terms of their connectedness. And that's why I styled his way of thinking as metaphorical. Uh -huh. The metaphor is the capacity, which is distinctively human. I don't, as far as I know, robots don't do this is the capacity to take one kind of experience and translate it into another kind of experience. meta -faring. It means the image behind that, it is itself a metaphor, that means you have at least two people, if not a whole group of people, carrying something from one place to another place together. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I would say that's a metaphor for ecological thinking. Ong does it, but of course, you know, he is, and he was attentive to that. He knew that he was trying to do ecological thinking. Whoops, I just lost the picture here. How'd I do that? Uh, can you, uh, I can hear you very clearly and we can see you very clearly. Okay, you can see me. I just yes. can't see you. I will, well, I'll help you fix it as soon as we get, go to the break, breakout room. That's great. So I don't know if that helps. No, it, it helps. So um, what we can do now uh, is I'll give you a chance to do a full uh, kind of wrap up. Uh, when we come back, but what I want to do is that I want to have a discussion because again, you know, we are kind of in this group, we are very much kind of pro conversation. So we will go and discuss for 20 minutes. Uh, so you'll be in one of the groups uh, with a bunch of folks, including me, and then we will go ahead, uh, discuss for 20 minutes uh, in a free flowing way, whatever it is that people and uh, everybody, when we come back, come back with the best question you have. The most important question you have for Randy. Okay, so we'll do Q and A as soon as we come back. So I'm starting the breakout rooms now. I heard something a little bit different because I actually heard the relationship between interiority and exteriority. Because it seems to me, uh, conversation, if they're both about uncovering the hidden, yeah. then it seems to me exteriority is about uncovering something that's new outside yeah. whereas uh if you talk about interiority it's more about disclosure of what you already know okay and that's why i talk about multiculturalism is that the give the person a voice to disclose what they could uncover so you also see their point of view now i'm not i'm going to skip over the complexity of multiplicity but it seems to me that disclosure, it, I, I kind of see it as a, as like one one track digesting and and the cow two stomach. You first <laughs> you first absorb the exterior, and then you have the priest a digestion, and you ruminate over what you discover, and then of course you sort of understand it. Maybe you don't totally you sort of understand it. And then it seems to me conversation causes the exterior stomach uh, others to, in a sense, redigest it. Absolutely. So in, in some sense. So therefore, it becomes a new dimension. I, I don't know if it's a higher dimension, but at least a new dimension of understanding from multiple perspectives if it's in a very diverse context. So it seems to me that's kind of important. I suppose you might be able to, if you are very, very clever, be able to ruminate with the text <laughs> first, and then maybe ruminate by standing in front of a mirror so forth and talk to yourself. You know, like, so in some sense, I think the Tuesday's digestion is possibly more refined 
than just the one stage digestion. So, so I, could you say something about that? Seems seems like an interesting idea. Well, I think that's an interesting metaphor. Uh, but of course, there's much more going on. When we are in a conversation, we're, we're chewing the same stuff back and forth. I, I don't know how you call that, but we do it in the context of, of all kinds of other things. Uh, the, the language we're speaking, the experience we have, the kind of work we do, who our families are, it's all of that's implicit in there. And we bring that to that conversation so that we're, somebody says something we get, it impresses on us and we then come back with a response. It's a two, dialogue is a two way thing. It's not just talking, it's talking and listening. And uh, the more people in the conversation, the, the richer it gets. Well, many, many animals, the mother actually pre digests the food. Right. To feed it yeah. to the baby, it right? So yeah. as she regurgitates the thing for the re digestion, then there's something else also going on. The nurturing and all that stuff comes in on the side as well. Thank you. When the, when the mother is singing uh, lullabies to, to the child, that's going on. I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah, I, I mean, I just have a very basic question as to when the, uh, when the Jesuits and the Dominicans were teaching Latin uh, in order to teach the trivium, why did they get away from that? What was the like the main reason to move away from the trivium and teaching Latin? And, and, and well, Latin, what we call the Romance languages are just Latin as it was continued to be spoken by by people on the street. Around the fifth century, you run into a problem where Ong deals with this in considerable detail. Well, around the fifth century, you got the place where grandchildren could not understand their uh their grandkids and vice versa because latin which was being spoken in at least latin speaking areas uh was changing and it changed into spanish and portuguese and you know you see this today that that it was writing that standardized the languages and especially the printing press up until that time they were kind of in free float why did they stop? Well, they, Latin was still there and the Dominicans and the Jesuits kept using it right on down until the, in the middle of the 20th century. But the thing is that the, uh, the, in the meantime, with the printing press, the, the vernaculars, that is to say, Spanish, French, Italian, et cetera, were in print and they were frozen in the print and, and the nation states are vernacular bubbles and then we got the Germans and the and the six Scandinavians and everybody else into the process. So I think that the reason that Latin was no longer used in in education by the Jesuits and the Dominicans and so on, and was because it you couldn't do it anymore. It was just too complicated. I mean, it, you have to teach them Latin first when they've. Well, they, some people still do that, but it's a whole lot easier to go into the vernacular languages and, and work because uh, you've got all these resources. Up until the printing press, there weren't any vernacular literatures, really. Uh, they weren't written down and they weren't accessible. You, you had classical Greek and Latin stuff that was in literacy. And by the time you get to the Middle Ages, the only people that could read and write Latin, or the only people who spoke Latin or used Latin on a daily basis were people who could read and write it. People on the street weren't speaking Latin anymore. They were speaking, well, they were speaking it, but it was in the form of Italian and Spanish and all the dialects within that. Real, real quickly, I don't know if you know that Father Ong has an article called Latin Language Studies of Publi Right, mm -hmm. where he discusses these issues. And you say it's mostly a masculine uh, enterprise that begins with meetings in order to learn Latin. And the other thing that's interesting here is that Father Rong, in his theology and philosophy courses, took the courses in Latin. His notes are in Latin still. And so we had a, some type of contact with that world.
Um, you know, there's two Sharons, so which one do you want? Okay, so my question was just, uh, because you had mentioned that Marshall McLuhan had uh, used as a foundation in a lot of his writings, the Trivium, can you give an example of something in McLuhan's writing that where you can see directly back to the Trivium? Boy, that's a fascinating question. I don't know if I can. Uh, oh, I that's okay. <laughs> Now, he, he does make a bleak reference to it, but I think where, where I would look, if I could think about it a little bit, and we don't have time for that, his, when he talks about the role of the artist, I think you see it there. When you see the way he approaches poetry and how he uses that kind of thing, you, you, can, you can sense that behind it, the, 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 the um, the presence of a certain kind of approach. Um, this is why I think he was fascinated by uh, by James Joyce and particularly Finnegan's Wake, because in his way of looking at it, uh, Joyce was really trying to work work out this epic uh, exercise through the the vernacular speaking of the language of the of the people on the on the street. I, I would uh, in, I'd probably defer to, to Tom here, who's the, the literary man. Uh, do, you, do you, Tom, do you have any thoughts on where McLuhan might have shown his interest in that? You know, probably not <clears throat> good enough, but there was a magazine that, that was circulating at St. Louis University uh, when McLuhan and Ong were there that dealt with uh, a lot of these issues. And uh, Ong was applying, I mean, sorry, Mc McLuhan was applying this to the American scene with the North and the South. And he's trying to put it into those type, same types of categories. Um, and I think it's also good. I, I was just getting down the book itself the, the subtitle is The Place of Thomas Nash and the Learning of His Time. Yeah. So this, this hey, uh, um, I, uh, some of you are saying somewhat the same thing, and it's the same thing that Russell Ackoff said, and, uh, <laughs> and even Roger Penrose. Uh, much of what happens in the uh, universe is an iterative process. <laughs> It's an iterative process. So it's not surprising that civilization is an, it is an iterative process. We could say that the iPhone uh, evolved from Sony's Walkman by random selection. Um, we can, uh, this is kind of a build a little, test a little, build a little, test a little over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, the Senate debates a new, a new law until the sausage is ready. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we have a similar situation that uh, Phil's cow uh, ruminates and gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it explodes. <laughs> and uh, the, the concept goes on and on. Now, the concept of exploding, we have a discontinuity, a singularity. And at the other side of that singularity, we either have a renaissance or we get propelled back into the Stone Age. And uh, so uh, uh, a lot's been written by these people, by, uh, by Russell Ackoff, who we've talked about, and uh, a, a few more people that I've vaguely heard about that we haven't talked about. Yeah. So I yield the balance of my time. I, th yeah, I think cyber so. has, has a, a lot of the people working at it from different angles. And that's one that I think is really important. Thank you. In line with what you just said about the imbalance, um, in our group, uh, we talked about the psychological constructs of uh, rigidity and fluidity. Um, and it seems like I think your parallel might perhaps be the open and closed system 
that you discussed. Um, and we talked about how we would teach something that was more open, multi-platform, multi-individuals, truly the digesting of information to create our own definitions and our own meaning. But here's my question. Do you think a part of that, why one potential reason that individuals are in a closed system is volitional? They don't want to think in an open way. And so she was. Um, should I have a voice? I'm not, was that directed at you, Shrink, on her? Either of you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure people do do that, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion because you can't. We don't grow like that. We we have to, from the beginning, we from before we're born, we're we're in an exchange with the world that we're in, and all our experience is mediated. Uh, if you get it, I'm going to like to point out that you, unless you, unless uh, you are in conversation with people, you really can't can grow. So. You can't live like that. We have to, everything from breathing air to talking, uh, we can't activate our inner thoughts without a language to do it in, um, et cetera. So uh, we can we can say we don't want to dialogue with, with somebody or some other people or whatever, and just stay as we are. Maybe we're threatened by the other or whatever, but it's very difficult, if not impossible, to pull that off. I think, uh, if I understand your question right, at least. Is that? Okay. Um, I keep on hearing the word cycle, and uh, I, uh, I think a lot of people miss the key point there. It's not just that it cycles. It is that we get feedback from an action and if that feedback tells us we're not going in the right direction, we can try to make corrections in some idea of a right direction. So in other words, it's a learning cycle. We almost should put the adjective in front of it to distinguish it between cycles that do not learn, for example. Yeah, it's only a cycle on when you narrow down to view it like very small because it's going on like this. I mean, we're constantly taking in all kinds of stuff and we learn what to advert to, what to pay attention to. Uh, culture teaches us, well, these things are most important and then these things are important. And so whatever we, we think is important in a given context, that's where we're going to get into pushing and shoving. And sometimes I think uh, back to Candace's point, people can get so overwhelmed by this that they don't, I think we see this in the political process. They get so overwhelmed by this stuff that they don't even know where to go. And so uh, McLuhan has a page on this in Medium is a Massage. The world is so big, you know, stay as you are. Uh, and I think there's a lot of attempts for, for people to, to try to do that. I don't think you can get away with it. So you gotta have a lot of other people wanting to do that too, the way you're, you know, get your little group. That's what's happening in polarization, I think. Hi, thank you. Um, what what would you say Ong's take on um, the element of time might be, and the the literality, the the ability of as Sri Khan was just speaking about in, in the process of writing and reflecting on your own writing um, also introduces the element of time and the, the aspects of Kronos and Kairos. And mm -hmm. um, did Ong approach that in any way? Well, yeah, I think time in a, ver in a variety of different ways is very, very central to his thinking. Uh, Matter of fact, he edited a collection of things called, um, uh, Tom, you may have to correct me, um, Knowledge in Time. And it was very, and I think that's what the, 
uh, orality manuscript uh, print electronic sequence is about that, that things grow over time the universe is a pro time begins with the uh, you know the big bang and here we are immense amount of time involved and things are going on in time and they're not they don't go backwards development has taken place and and we're we experience that all the time in our own lives i mean you don't get stop being five years old and go on to being six you're just five years old in a new way i mean it, it, we accumulate that and that's we ruminate on it what we remember about our earlier uh experiences it's very important if we if you we know what happens if you lose your capacity to negotiate time and memory absolutely critical uh, you get alzheimer's or something of that sort so uh, <laughs> Yeah, we, we live in a in an era of multi uh, multimedia for sure. And I wonder if that itself is not an uh, illusion in this sense, like especially when we could ch uh, choose the channel to listen to these or hear these multimedias, then it seems to me is not only looking in a mirror and have a reflection of yourself and that's it. So so therefore, uh, it, it would be like living in a hall of mirrors with multiple mirrors are reflecting back and you you thought that these were multiple perspectives but in fact they were all just a reflection of yourself and i just wonder whether that is a replacement for multiculturalism in which actually different people appears in the mirror on the doorway <laughs> rather than just yourself reflecting back on yourself with the illusion of uh uh you know of of this panth pantheon of things that you are distracted from the essential thing so it becomes an illusion multiple illusions just pick a cable news channel yeah I, I should give you my first grader grandson he could tell you all about this uh he's much better at it than i am uh, in terms of functioning almost instinctively i don't know where these kids get this stuff but they know how to do this in ways that i don't I, this is why I think generational aspects of this are extremely important in our present circumstance. Uh, anyway, um, we're in the very early stages of this secondary reality thing. I mean, it's a new phenomenon. There have been maybe comparable or analogous situations in the past, but the enormity and the speed at which this one's taken place, as McLuhan shows over and over again, is just beyond anybody's real coping. And we, you know, we just see examples every day, the computer scams, uh, the uh, hijacking of the pipelines. I mean, all we don't, have, nobody has a clue. Pandemic stuff. Uh, if you go back to earlier times when disastrous things happened, people just couldn't do very much about it. So you just sort of kind of went in and you picked up and went on. But now we're in a predicament where we, expect of ourselves to have some kind of response we should be able to fix this and and that's a that's the thing my I, my mother used to make the remark she was born in 1918 and in a, on a farm in nebraska and she she said well you knew there was a world out there but it didn't have anything to do with you well i don't think that's the experience at least in the in the uh, kids that are around the electronic world that's not their experience we haven't learned how to deal with this stuff yet i think phil's point is is really right on too that uh, we have to develop and, and we I, i'm not going to do it <laughs> I, i'm not going to be around long enough uh, the people behind us will will have to find new strategies for coping with this we've we've hardly begun <clears throat> Oh, the, oh, yeah, I, it's astounding. It's astounding. Oh, going back to the same point with uh, which we seem to all be sort of doing uh, 
what Tom Gilb described as process learning and process optimization, optimization um, is analogous to uh, the same thing that Russell Ackoff said and when he when mm -hmm. he showed up in our uh, meetings. Um, uh, Boyd's OODA loop is essentially that um, uh, that you keep moving and you keep iterating and and um, Moore's law of exponential growth is, is an example of that. But uh, it also includes a quickening that uh, it, uh, the coefficients uh, keep changing. So the quickening occurs, the doubling occurs uh, much faster. Um, and uh, we shouldn't forget Ray Kurzweil's concept of a singularity where that cow eventually eats enough that it explodes and dies. Mm -hmm. So I'll yield again the balance of my time. Yeah, but how do you deal with uh, algorithms that nowadays presume to know more about you than yourself? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, like that. Then, in a sense, is it's kind of like a distorted mirror. <laughs> You're looking at yourself in a distorted mirror because, I, like, you know, if Socrates says "know thyself," how do you know yourself when somebody else? That trying to sell you something knows more about you than you, you, you yourself. They they could manipulate you easily. Yeah. Well, like I said, we're we're it's like every time one of these things comes up on your computer screen that uh, that you you got to learn how to sniff out the scam. It's it's not easy and it's scary to do because I I I don't have a clue how to deal with those all of those kinds of things. They're too fast. If, if you, uh, I, I, I can deal with texts a whole lot better because it takes a lot of time. I would, um, I'd say for if, it, it, you know, it, I would read his, his real monograph work, uh, The Presence of the Word, uh, the uh, Ramus Method and the Decay of Dialogue is, is a tough slug. It's a big, huge, complex thing. But you, you know, by the time you come out the other side, it's like reading the McLuhan's thing on the trivium. You, you're going to have a pretty good feel for the way these things work. I think at least in Ong's approach to it. So the presence of the word, but you know, uh, inter but he wrote these other books that went with it, the interfaces of the word. I mean, he's all about, he wrote a book, he likes, he likes connections. He wrote a book called Frontiers in American Catholicism. He wrote a book called Crossroads. I mean, he's, he's looking for interfaces, crossroads, connections between a, a lot of different things, usually with historical things. So presence of the word, Ramus, and, uh, the Ramus Method and the Decay of Dialogue. Um, but also, um, uh, he's got one romance, rhetoric, romance, and technology. His book, um, very different kind of thing, but still dealing with the same kinds of themes, and is uh, his book Hopkins, the Self and God. Uh, he has one uh, called um, Fighting for Life: Contest, Sexuality, and Consciousness dealing with the same issues, but more along gender lines. I mean, I, it'd be real interesting to get some feedback on. That one isn't one talked much about. I think it's probably too too sensitive a, a thing. Uh, and I haven't been at it for a long time. But read his major monographs. I would start there. How to keep on learning. 